Uh, yes, so good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to this masterclass uh, hosted by the Dual Flow Facility. Um, as a start, we will introduce ourselves. Um, my name is Brenda Amon, and um, I am the Portfolio Relationship Manager with the Dual Flow Facility. Over to you, Alvin. All right, thank you, Brenda, and welcome, everyone. An investment officer here at the Dual Flow Facility. Yeah, so Alvin and I will be taking you through this masterclass today. And uh, our masterclass today is really on something that we feel is very key as we end the year and plan the next year, especially for you entrepreneurs that are on the investment journey or on the journey uh, as you look for funding. So today our topic really is on how, how you can prepare uh, different documents, but our focus will be on uh, pitch decks and then also understanding the due diligence process. So before we proceed, um, just some, some uh, ground rules. Uh, we are muting everyone else except Alvin and I. Uh, we will have a session for Q&A. However, if you have some burning questions that you feel we need to do throughout the session, kindly use the chat room. We will be able to read uh, to read your comments and then answer them as we go along. Uh, also, the session is being recorded because we will need to share this across to other people that have not been able to make it. So we'll record the session and uh, feel free to reach out to us in the chat room. However, we will have a Q&A session at, 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 at the end of our presentation. We would like this to be as interactive as possible. So your question chat room would really um, help us with that. So going right into the session of today, uh, just a brief about the deal flow facility for those who have not interacted with us before. Uh, the deal flow facility is a non-investing um, uh, a, a non-investing facility. Uh, what we do is we match make entrepreneurs uh, at the growth stage level with different investors that we have in our portfolio so that think of the deal flow facility as as a matchmaker so we have investors on one side and we have ugandan entrepreneurs on the other side so we then link them together and in between there we do offer a capacity building and this session kind of speaks into what our overall objective is um, other than just uh, connecting entrepreneurs and investors, we also hope to improve the ecosystem or to improve um, the, the investment environment within the country. And that includes uh, knowledge sharing sessions like this. So that is funded by European Union and we are supported by Capital Markets Authority of Uganda. We are sector agnostic. So we are looking to work with uh, entrepreneurs from different uh, sectors within Uganda. And uh, our criteria is that we are looking for companies that are registered and operating in Uganda for at least two years and are looking for capital of 500,000 and above. However, like I mentioned earlier, our objective is also to, to grow the ecosystem through knowledge sharing. And this is part of uh, one of the things that we, that we do as the deal flow facility to improve the, in, in the environment that we operate in. So um, we'll just go through We've, we've gone through a series of, um, of, of master classes. Uh, if you look on your screen, uh, we had started a session on sessions on how entrepreneurs can, pre can prepare for investments. So there's a journey that as an entrepreneur, you would have to go through, uh, starting with defining exactly what you want and what you want the, the, the funding for. Because we note that sometimes in investors think they actually need some level of funding and they may not actually need or there are incidences where they may actually need more than they are asking for. And then determining where you would get your funding from. Is it from a bank? Is it from a private investor? Is it from family and friends? Where would you be able to access financing? And then working on your business operating model, uh, understanding the different your financial performance, because that is also or you are eligible to, to whatever funding you're asking for and also gives different investors an insight on who you are as a company. So where we are right now is on uh, how you prepare documents in order to attract investors. And this is something that we feel uh, is very key for different entrepreneurs in the investment journey. So I will just um, 
take us through the next slide, which is the different uh, documentation that we require. We will not spend much time on this. Uh, this is just for you to have an idea of what the different documents are that investors uh, or funders look for as they determine whether they are interested in your company or not. And, and surprisingly, this is also something that I'm sure some of the banks also ask for. Uh, the pitch documents is really the pitch deck today, which is our area of focus. Uh, investment memorandums, executive summaries and summary sheets, including a financial snapshot. So that when you're having an introduction meeting with investors, this is what you, pre you prepare for them and they have an understanding of who you are as a company. Then we also look at KYC, uh, which is know your customer and uh, due diligence documents. And this, this range between legal and compliance documents. So this is where your inco incorporation documents come in, your memats, uh, your social media, and your cap table, that's your capitalization table. This is where they would fall in. And then also what investors sometimes or most times look at are the operational documents. So I had earlier mentioned the financial documents. So are your accounts audited? What are your management accounts like? What is your What are your projections like? The valuation documents, your burn rate tracker, and your annual budgets and then strategic planning documents because investors would really like to know what your strategy is, what is your go-to market plan, what is your product portfolio and what are your plans or strategy around growing your business. And then next we would then look at the administrative or capability documents. And this basically look at your, your corporate governance. For example, do you have an organogram do you have uh, CVs prepared for your key manage uh, for your key management team do you have HR manuals in place uh, business continuity documents succession plans and other administrative documents especially the policies that most of that speak to who you are as a company or speak to what you are working towards and how you have protected yourself because we know that investors at the end of the day, are investing money into your company and are expecting a return. So it's important for them to know how you are protected or how well prepared you are as a company. So we will just go to our topic of the day, which is really the pitch deck. And um, I think uh, we will start with a question to Alvin really is why is a pitch deck important? And why should the entrepreneurs that have dialed into this session uh, pay attention to the to the pick, especially as they start their journey towards funding. All right. Oh, sorry about that. I think I was on mute. Sorry. I think you can now all hear me. So uh, as I was saying, as the deal for facility, we, we've we had these several classes and, and uh, we're really trying to work with the entrepreneur through, through the different stages and steps that they go through as they look to raise capital. And sort of the document that begins that journey is this pitch deck. So the reason I would say it's, it's really important because it's that document that opens the doors uh, for an investor. It's often the first document that you share with an investor to really give them insight into your business, um, the impact of your business, but also the potential of your business. So let's say um, you've attended a pitching event, or you've had a conversation with an investor and you've really gone through the typical elevator pitch, you've told them what the business is about and you see that they're really interested. The next step really is, is for you to share this, this, pitch, this pitch deck 
which really is a summary of your business that talks about what problem are you solving? Um, how uniquely are you solving this problem? And sort of what is the potential of the business going forward? But also, what have you been what have you achieved uh, with what you've been able to do? So for me, I think it's a critical document. I know in these days it's 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 becoming more of a buzzword, but that doesn't take away the importance of, of this document. Okay. Yeah. yeah, thanks for that. And and um and I know for a fact that uh, for some of the entrepreneurs that are in this session, you've maybe a uh, prepared pitch documents before, and and you know, some of you are planning to prepare the pitch documents a good pitch document have? What are those components that uh, entrepreneurs should highlight or focus on as they prepare pitch documents to present to uh, future funders or investors? That's a good question. Because one, um, every business is unique. And so with every pitch deck, the pitch deck should be able to tell this unique story of the company. So even as you look at uh, the different sections that we have highlighted here on the slide, you, if you already have a pitch deck and you're comparing these sections, the certain sections may be similar yeah. and certain sections may differ. But generally, uh, what we're trying to do here is just look at the key sections that should be in a pitch deck. And then thereafter, in every section, uh, an entrepreneur can then go ahead to tailor them to the different needs and sort of the unique uh, aspects of the business. Remember that um, if you're in a stage of fundraising, you will be speaking to multiple investors, of, often a dozen or so or more. And so you'll find that you have to tailor your pitch deck to address and to appeal to the interests of, of this particular investor. So let's say you're meeting an investor that's, it's, that's keen on impact. The section you have to definitely include uh, maybe in your traction slide, um, information that talks about, for example, uh, how many products you've sold, um, how are you working with farmers? How are you working with women? That kind of thing. But just going back to these general sections, remember, as we've talked about, this speech deck is one of the beginning documents that gets you started on your fundraising journey. And so most times it's, it's more of a summary of the business. So you don't want it to be too lengthy and you don't want it to also miss out on the critical elements of your business. So. We recommend about 10 to 12 slides, as you've seen here in the sections that we have highlighted. But to begin it all, there should be a slide that really introduces the business and introduces it in a concise and succinct way. In that um, an investor or whoever is looking at this pitch deck is able to know what exactly the business does all through just one line, one, one, line, one sentence. So um, it's important for you to be precise, but also mention critical elements of your business. And so this opening slide really helps the, the investor to understand, okay, uh, this is, for example, a business in the agriculture space. This is a business in the energy sector. This is a fintech just based on that one liner that describes what the business does. And then I think these two next sections are more common slides that I think um, everyone should have in their pitch deck. This is just the problem that you're solving. So with the problem slide, you're really talking about what are the pain points of the customer? How difficult is, is it for them to access a service? Um, what gaps exist in the market? Um, what are hindrances to the customer having a better experience, really? 
And then after that, having talked about the problem, you then talk about your unique solution. What are you doing to make uh, your customer's life easier? What sets you apart? What, what does, how does your solution set you apart from other people that are solving the same problem that these customers have? Here you can go into some slight details on your product and really um, how that product fits into the life of the customer and how it makes it easier for them to, to really access the service or the product. And then the next one um, is really, why are you solving this problem now? I mean, in a world where there are several hundred problems, um, why is it that this one makes sense right now? And why is it the right time to be solving this problem or to be in this industry or in this market? So here, for example, um, taking an example of things around um, the environment and climate change is definitely something that's big on the agenda for everyone right now. And so if your business was in that sector, you talk about things around maybe um, pollution, you talk about um, reduced productivity in the land, you'll be talking about um, the adverse effects on people's health. You'll be talking about how right now, this is something that's trending. This is something that um, everyone is looking at. And so it just gives you um, the importance of what you're doing because an investor will have several entrepreneurs pitching to them, but you need to show them that the market in which you're playing in is a market, it's a vibrant market, a market that um, is calling on lots of attention and a market that is something that you're supposed to be in right now, right? And then uh, the next slide would be uh, market size. Here, really, it's important uh, for the entrepreneur to, to demonstrate that they know the industry that they are working in and they know the scale of that industry. So this is where uh, your numbers and your assumptions come into play in that you know, first of all, you know who your target customer is and you've really profiled who they are. So you know that, for example, if my product appeals to um, young people from the ages of 25, mid say to 40, you know that this is the certain number of, this is the number of people in that age group in Uganda, for example. And then you can say, if my product is only appealing to those in the urban areas. So you're sort of slicing up the market to give the investor a sense of the size and scale of the market that you're working in. So here it's important really for you to know who your target customer is, know what are their tests and preferences, uh, know is it a growing market? Is it a shrinking market? Or is it a stagnant market? All that just gives the investor a good understanding of where you're playing and really the size of the opportunity at hand. Uh, the next slide is really just on uh, competition. Um, most times you will find that you're offering similar solutions just as um, other companies or businesses. And so it's important to acknowledge uh, your competition, uh, know areas where they're doing well, but also know areas where you have a And so this slide uh, can point you into areas that maybe you need to improve. Um, for example, if uh, you're not a market leader in your industry, you're able to benchmark with uh, those that are doing it well, those that, that have a large market share in your industry, understand what makes them stand out, and then learn and incorporate those into your business, or identify gaps that they are not serving and be able to serve those markets. Mm -hmm. So it really, this slide really sets the business apart in terms of uh, how, what different, 
what are you doing differently compared to your competition? But also what can you, what else can you do to improve and grow your market share? Uh, the next slide would be just on more details on the products. Because remember, you've already talked about your problem that you're solving, the solution, the market and the competition. And here in, on the product slide, you're really going into more details on the product. If it's say um, a software solution, uh, you're detailing really maybe uh, how the user experience of this product, um, what are customers saying about it, um, what different functions does it have, um, what really uh, makes this product unique and stand out. The next one is really just on the business model of the business. Uh, how do you earn uh, your revenue? Do you have a sort of subscription that uh, customers pay to on a monthly basis? Um, do you have different pricing uh, categories for different customers you serve? How is it that the business makes money? So in this slide, you're really showing um, what it takes for customers to enjoy your product and how you're earning from it. So it's really how you're pricing your value and um, what that means for the business and the different ways you make money. Now, one of uh, the most underrated slides in a pitch deck is one that talks about the team. Now, remember, most of for early stage businesses, investors are really looking out to the personnel and the team, the human resources. Because oftentimes you find that you have limited traction if it's an early stage business. And the investor wants to be able to trust that you have the necessary experience and competence to be able to grow the business. So this is a slide you should not uh, shy away from. It's a slide where you really talk about the team, um, what are their experience, what's their experience, uh, what's their technical expertise and how does that play into really growing the business and uh, really uh, transforming the business so it's it's a slide that um, you should not uh, despise more so for early stage businesses for for more mature businesses it's also as equally important because oftentimes the investor wants to see that you can continuously replicate the success of the business and you have um, the necessary skills to be able to take the business to the next level. So it's a really, really important slide. And uh, I think it's really one that you should not shy away from. And then really the last slide that ties everything together is on financials. So this really shows um, the viability and feasibility of the business. Um, how are you growing? Um, how are you managing your costs? Um, what are your margins? Um, is the business profitable or not? And if the business is not profitable, are you showing a path to profitability? Are your revenues increasing in that the the investor has a sense of when the business will be profitable. Here, the investor is also able to see on a high level if the business is able to absorb uh, the capital that you're requesting for. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the slide, we're definitely going to say, uh, this is my business, this is what we have done. And because of what we have done, we're looking for, let's say $300,000 uh, to take us to the next level. So the ask which comes at the end really ties in into the financials that you've been able to, to showcase um, beforehand. So it's, it's really, of course, the investor will ask for more detailed information on financials later on, but really this gives them a sense of, 
I mean, having talked about the problem solution and the market, it gives them a really is a is a business viable. Does the business have legs? So it really just ties together all that you've you've said in the previous slides. Yeah. Wow, that's that's. Um, thank you for taking us through that, um, Alvin. I think um, what's important there to note is that much as this, much as we highlighted the ten areas that you need to focus on, uh, you can always make the deck unique to your company. So of course you would not forget simple things like the um, your, your your company logo and other areas. For example, like impacts, like he mentioned that you would like to, and also depending on, on who you are um, uh, sharing that deck with. The other thing to note is that different investors uh, have different requirements. So it's also not ideal to use the same pitch deck every time someone says, oh, there's an opportunity to share the same pitch deck. Sometimes it's important to kind of uh, uh, just customize the pitch deck depending on who you're sending it to. Uh, so, um, Alvin, from your experience, what are some of the um, some of the common mistakes that entrepreneurs make as they as they prepare the pitch decks? What are the things that they need to look out for uh, that may kind of uh, limit their um, that that may not make their pitch deck as appealing as it should be? All right. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Brenda. So just to begin, um, I think it's important to note that these investors oftentimes are reviewing up to even several hundred um, applications or uh, pitch decks. And so oftentimes they are really critical on what you would call uh, the simple areas. And I mean, to be fair, um, if you're trying to raise um, capital, you're saying you've built uh, a strong business, you're trying to be as appealing as possible to, to the investor. Because remember, this pitch deck is, is that first document uh, the investor sees and forms an opinion about your company or your business. And so you want to really present the best that you can. You want to put your best foot forward. And so as you're preparing uh, to raise capital, it's important to take note of just a couple of things that we, we have seen um, with businesses as they send out pitch decks and also uh, feedback from, from investors on areas that uh, entrepreneurs should look out for. So just like we said to begin with, a pitch deck is really a summary document. Um, and so it should not be too detailed and too lengthy. So, I mean, imagine you're an investor and you have a 30 slide pitch deck to review. Oftentimes you'll find that um, there's a bit of repetition in the, in the number, in the slides, in the content on the slides. And so, as we said before, we recommend that uh, you keep this to at least a dozen slides. 12 slides should be able to really uh, communicate uh, what your company is about, how you're solving a particular problem, your traction, and you ask. So, because it's inevitable, once the, the investor is interested in your idea or business, that they are going to request for more information. So, you're already sell, selling yourself short by sending a lengthy document. And yet at the end of the day, one, you, you, you're also gauging the investor's interest in your business, but also you want to make it easy for the investor to say yes and, and say, okay, let's take it to the next step. I'm really interested. The other one that uh, we've seen is entrepreneurs including very technical language in their pitch deck. So let's say it's an energy business that's, that's doing solar. There is, there is, at this stage, there is no need for you to really go into the technical details of uh, maybe specifications of the kind of solar panels that you use, um, going into 
calculations into um, the energy, you know, the, the, the really complex energy calculations and, and adding it to your pitch deck. At this point, it's, I mean, the investor has a general idea of, of the industry. And if it's unavoidable, we encourage you just to maybe explain a bit of the, of, of the technical language in a footnote, if it's really a critical point that you cannot leave out. But really, there'll be a point in time for uh, the technical specifications and the technical language. But at the pitch tech stage, it's really um, unnecessary. Um, the other one that I talked about in the previous slide was not emphasizing your team. Your team, it experiences um, similar work it has done. Um, if you have founders, for example, that have uh, that have experience in that in that industry, this is the point where you can highlight them, because remember, the investor is buying into people and the team, and the investor does not expect you to have everything uh, solved and all the answers to the questions. But with a team that has uh, the requisite experience, that that is willing to really grow the business. That's oftentimes uh, what makes or break. And so please, please, please don't um, don't gloss over this team slide. It's super, super important. And then, um, really, as we talked about, the slide deck should tell a unique story uh, of the business. And so it's up to you to customize the information to the different investors that you will be speaking and sending this information to. It's also um, worthwhile investing time to make this, this pitch deck uh, as appealing as possible. I mean, it's not like you have to uh, hire a graphics designer and all, but definitely if you have clean, uh, well put together organized slides, it goes a long way in showing the investor that you are organized and you put time and effort into really conveying this information uh, to the investor. The last one I will talk about is really just running through your, your pitch deck and the information you're sharing. Imagine it, it, it's really uh, embarrassing, for example, for you to be on stage pitching and you, you see a spelling error on your, on your presentation, right? So it just goes to speak to how meticulous and how careful you are as an investor to just make sure everything is really in order. In a world where um, these investors are looking at several um, pitch decks, small things like this um, can be difference between you securing an investment or not. So just take the time, look through what you've shared. Does it make sense to you? Uh, have another member of your team look through it and really see that that you'll be proud of. Um, the last one that I would talk about that's not in the slide is that as much as um, a pitch deck is a document, it always goes with you as the presenter, right? So you need to have a certain level of soft skills to be able to one, um, identify the audience that you're pitching to, see what appeals to them, but also be able to tell the most appealing and compelling story about your business. Because at the end of the day, um, the best story gets funded. So to complement a well put together pitch deck, it's also as equally important for the presenter or the entrepreneur to be able to appeal to the audience that they are pitching to yeah wow um i think um there's there's nothing more i can add to that especially on 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 um the last point that alvin mentioned in terms of who actually goes to present the pitch but a question that came through uh the chat to me alvin is uh if the entrepreneur is not able to produce uh the perfect pitch deck are there, um, are there consultants or are there individuals or companies that, that entrepreneurs could approach 
for them to be for to 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 kind of uh, help companies prepare these these pitch decks, or is it something that they have to do themselves? Yeah, I think yeah, that's a that's a great question, and I think I. Uh, you're being honest to 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 what you can and what you cannot do, but also that shows the willingness to really, as we've said, put put out a high quality uh, material. So yes, uh, there's quite a lot of uh, help in that regard. Um, there are a number of, of online tools and templates that can uh, help you really put together the pitch deck. And where you're able to also customize, I think um, we can be able to share that uh, after this session, a couple of those templates. But also, the online templates can also work together with a number of service providers, a number of um, sort of um, that, because in this market, we have a lot of accelerators, we have a lot of incubators. We have a lot of parties that are willing and able to help you to push that, put together that pitch deck. So maybe in case uh, you need more information on, on, on that, in addition to the online templates, we can definitely support on that and we can definitely point you in the right direction uh, for a person that will be able to support you on that. Yeah. Thank you. And also just to for those that have joined in um, after we started the session, uh, please utilize our chat box to put in any questions that you think are relevant or, or anything that you would like to contribute uh, to the to that the discussion at at hand. Um, I think I will move on to the next topic. Uh, that was it on, on the pitch deck. And as Alvin mentioned, as the deal flow facility, we would be able to guide you and point you in the right direction in terms of how you can prepare um, the perfect pitch decks. Uh, I, I will now move on to the topic of due diligence. Uh, the deal flow facility is for a year now. And uh, we've, 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 we've interacted with a couple of entrepreneurs who, who have kind of asked us uh, about the relevance of our due diligence. Because for most of them, it's, they say, you know, you've spoken to me, you understand what my need is, I've shared my financials. Why else do you need to perform a due diligence on me and or my company? And why would the investor still need to perform a due diligence if I've shared with you a few documents here to tell you about who I am as a company. So we thought it was important to also just um, take us through the, the due diligence process, why it is important and why investors uh, look at, uh, take, uh, why investors go through the due diligence process. And also as an entrepreneur, what would you need to prepare for uh, is, uh, as investors come to perform due diligence on you. So um, Alvin, uh, maybe you could just uh, take us through what a due diligence is for starters and why is it important and what is the process flow like uh, when companies are going through this investment journey? What, what would the due diligence process look like? You can just paint that picture for us. All right, yeah, great. So, I mean, earlier we have been we have been uh, talking just, about just a second. Um, Magambolati, I see your hand is up. Uh, we'll just we'll um, okay. We we um, Magambo. Okay, so Alvin, you can maybe take us through the due diligence process. Uh, why is it important and why do investors invest time and energy into going through the whole due diligence process? All right, yeah, thank you for that. So just like we had uh, been talking about, we have really been focusing on uh, the pitch deck. Who 
you can now hear me right so we've been talking about a pitch deck and really how that document is the first uh, information really that you'll share with an investor so assuming um, all goes well uh, the investor is interested in your business um, then they're willing to really uh, carry on and invest in your business there's a part uh, with every investment called a due diligence. Now, just for everyone to understand, I'll step away from, from the investment space. So just to paint a picture for you, consider that you are, let's say, you're hunting for a house, right? You're looking for a house, be it a part, an apartment, um, or for example, you're looking to buy land, right? If someone came to you and said, you know what, there's, let's say one acre of land uh, in the countryside, uh, it's a really good piece of land, uh, you should buy it. I know you've been looking for land, uh, you should buy it. Definitely, um, you wouldn't simply pay for that land, right? Without uh, going there physically, um, speaking to the locals about the land, engaging the local authorities, uh, verifying things like land titles, uh, meeting the buyer, meeting the seller, all those kind of things. That in itself is due diligence. It's simply the steps you take to ascertain something, right? The same way before buying a car, you'd want to know does it have any uh, mechanical condition? Um, is the engine all right? Is it working well? Um, you take it for a checkup, right? Before you buy the car. So the due diligence is just really making sure that you understand completely whatever you're going through, whatever you're getting into, right? So in this case of an investor and in the investment, in the investment space, this due diligence is really for the investor to confirm and to ascertain what exactly they are investing in, right? So in, in the pitch, you've made these claims, you've said, um, in my industry, I'm the market leader, um, my product is the best, uh, my customers are happy, my revenue is through the roof, the business is really doing well. I'm the best that you can ever invest in, right? Investor says, oh, okay, sure. They have to also confirm that this is actually true. Remember, they are putting, uh, they're investing their capital in you. They're investing their time and they're investing their belief in you, right? So most of for, for equity deals where an investor is buying into your company and becoming a shareholder in your company, the due diligence process is really, really critical. For, for dead deals, it's still as important, although it may not be as intense. As I've said, it's just a process by which the investor confirms and gets to understand what exactly that they're investing in and to confirm that whatever you've, you've told them about the business is true and that the business actually exists on ground and that it's not just something that is pretty on the outside, but something that actually is a functional, well-run business, right? So I remember at the beginning of, of the presentation, we talked about preparing for an investor, or preparing to raise capital. And with it, you definitely have to prepare yourself by putting together this set of documents that the investor will later on review or look at. 
So remember, we talked about the strategy documents. We talked about the financials. We talked about um, KYC documents. We talked about operational documents. So most times what happens is documents are collected and put together in um, a data room. Now, this data room can be a specific folder that contains all these documents and that you will share with, with an investor. Most times what happens is we encourage um, entrepreneurs to set them up on, uh, on an online uh, platform, let's say uh, Dropbox or Google Drive. I know that whenever an investor asks for these documents, they are readily available. What we've had from, from various entrepreneurs is that one, this due diligence process drags on for so long, they ask for so much uh, documentation, and it sort of feels like it's not coming to an end, right? But I would say that what determines how long this due diligence process will be, it's also a factor of how prepared you are. So knowing that capital raising journey and a journey that you need to be prepared for, it's important for you to put together this set of documents in this folder so that as soon as the investor asks for them, you're able to readily share with the investor and therefore you're able to limit their delays, right? The only uh, thing that you'll be waiting for is either feedback from the investor or um, processing other documents that you may not have pr prepared beforehand, right? So it's super, super important just to limit the strain of this process because oftentimes you'll find for unprepared entrepreneurs, there's a lot of back and forth between the investor uh, and the entrepreneur saying, oh, send me this document. Oh, I haven't prepared it. Can you please wait two weeks? And remember, as we have said, we're just trying to have as smooth as possible a process, right? So prepare these documents um, to make sure that um, they actually the documents you, you are able to share. And then as soon as the investor asks for these documents. Now, let's say you've shared these documents and they're being reviewed by the investor. What often happens is that in addition to reviewing, let's say this, this, this folder, this, plat this data room that you put together, most investors will actually push for a site visit. A site visit whereby a team from from a, a team of the investment of the investor comes down to to visit your premises to interact really with with you the management team to really check out that you're actually selling some products that you have a well established and run business on ground so this complements all the documents that you've shared and this also gives them more comfort over their business. Having known, let's say, you have five branches, we're able to visit all these branches across the country, just really to build comfort, but also to have a discussion with you in terms of what are the risks that we are seeing. Um, you mentioned that your product, let's say, is a market leader, it's the best in the market but we have found out that there's actually this competitor. How are we uh, maneuvering that? So it's really, think of it as a way for you guys, for you and the investor to come to a consensus, really base whatever decision you're coming to on facts and really understand, understand where the investor is coming from in terms of um, identifying risks, but also you as the entrepreneur be able to to spare time to answer these questions, but to also provide comfort to the investor that, you know what, um, yes, the 
but I feel maybe in the next two or three years, my product will be the best. So it's really a time for you to speak and interact with the investor. So don't think of it as a, as a process where, a one-sided process where the investor simply asks so many questions, uh, interrogates, scrutinizes the company, but think of it as a collaborative process. Because as much as uh, the investor wants to support you with their capital and time, they also want to make sure that they know what exactly they're going, they're getting into and are best positioned to support. So with this side visit, uh, it will be important. Most times investors request to speak to key managers. They also request to speak to customers that you're selling your product to. And in some cases also speak to regulatory bodies, say let's say UNBS, say um, the National Drug Authority for sectors or businesses that are highly regulated, just so that they can build a complete picture of the business. So as you can see from the screen, the first three processes are where you have the most involvement, where you would be involved the most. After that is done, the investor has to sit down and really understand the business in and out and be comfortable with the level of risk that they're taking on. So here you, you have a discussion with the investor and say, okay, here are the key risks that we identified. And what they want to know from you is how are you mitigating or protecting the business against those risks? So this entire discussion really forms, uh, gives the investor a better understanding of the opportunity and helps the investor to know how best suited they are to support the business or uh, to be able to identify key risks that, that affect the, invest, the, the business. So it's from these findings really that form um, the next steps of engagement with the investor. Say, okay, this is how much we shall be investing. And uh, these are the terms maybe that we will be investing on. And then it's up to you to really say, yes, I accept these terms or no, I do not accept these terms. So really in a nutshell, the due diligence process is a process where the investor uh, builds comfort over the opportunity that they're getting into, but also an opportunity for the entrepreneur to provide comfort to the investor based on the different risks that have been identified. Yes. Yeah, so we can say that um, the due diligence process is like a fact-finding mission on the investor side. Uh, there's a question that came through from uh, Kenneth Kosiga. I think we'll take it. Um, it's been covered in the next slide, so we'll take it then. Uh, his question was, is it possible for entrepreneurs to to also do due diligence on, on investors. That is very key, it's very important, and it's something that we will also talk about uh, shortly. And um, I see Magambo, you, your, your hand is up. I don't know if you have a question. You can uh, unmute and uh, ask your question. Good morning. Hello? Good morning. Yes, Magambo. Good morning. Good morning, madam. We can't hear you. I don't know. I see you. Hello. Here, but hello. We can't hear you. Hello. Good morning. Okay. Good so morning. maybe you can you can, you can maybe type it to us in the in the chat room. Um, allow us to proceed with the uh, with the presentation. So Alvin, uh, you've taken us through the process and you've also talked about. Um, why it's important. And I know we can go to the next slide. You had also kind of mentioned um, what the different components, so what the different over due diligence. So uh, maybe you can briefly take us through the, the three components of the, of the due diligence process before we move on to the other elements. All right, thank you. So remember, uh, just like Brenda mentioned, this is a fact-finding mission, right? It's a, it's a process where the investor confirms uh, 
whatever you've been saying and sort of really all the claims that you've been making about the business. So in this fact-finding mission, there are generally three um, areas that will be uh, looked at. Uh, one is the commercial due diligence. By commercial due diligence, it really speaks to the viability of the business in terms of what product are you selling? Does the product actually have uh, a, a growing demand? What, um, what is the competitive advantage of the company, really? So in commercial, it's understanding where the business uh, stands in terms of the industry uh, and also in terms of the product that it, it sells. Does it make sense for us selling this particular product at this time? Remember, and just to tie it back to the pitch deck, remember you talked about the sections where you talked about the problem, the solution, uh, your product, uh, why this product right now, but also the market, right? So all that information that you shared in those slides is now what's being investigated here, right? So in this, in, if you say, for example, that my product, um, my product is the best, it's a market leader, now that's what we are finding out here. And that's why, as we said, the would-be investor tends to also talk, up, talk to customers for a product, talks to um, your stakeholders, such as your suppliers, talks to regulatory authorities, to really understand that where does this business, where does this product lie? Is this business actually selling a product that um, has demand? And going forward, what does the market look like? Will it continue to be feasible for us to sell this product? And can we increase our market share? What other new products can we introduce? Um, that kind of thing. Here we'll also be looking at things around maybe pricing. Is it appropriately priced? Um, is your product currently too expensive for customers? And that's why you're not selling it to as many customers. Um, are we underpricing the product? Can we make more margins on our product? That kind of thing. So really going into the nitty gritty of sort of the product, sort of the product market fit, um, and also understanding how the business is able to make money and also serve its customers. The other area which um, most are familiar with right now is the financial and tax due diligence. Tax due diligence. So here, remember, in one of the documents that you've shared, you've shared your past uh, financial performance. Here, in case, for example, for uh, audited financial statements, the investor is really just going through that documentation, seeing that um, your revenue was growing, what were the drivers for that revenue? Did we actually correctly um, this amount of revenue? Um, these expenses, were they actually spent? So most times what happens is this part of the due diligence is outsourced to say an audit firm that then dives deep into the financials. So in the documents that you would submit for this, in addition to audited financials, would be management accounts, would also be uh, source documents, just so that everything that you're sharing really adds up and that the investor or anybody can independently verify that, let's say, if you said you made uh, $2 million last year, it's actually true that you made $2 million and that, that is actually uh, verifiable. Um, a big area that we're seeing this uh, currently is, is on tax. Um, as you know, with the ever-changing uh, regulations from the URA, 
uh, we, have, we have seen an increasing number of customers, of, 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 of businesses engaged in sort of back and forth with the URA, disputing various taxes, um, really understanding these new uh, tax uh, legislations, things around uh, IFRIS, things around all these new uh, taxes that have been introduced. And so with the tax due diligence, we are going back still really compute, for example, if let's say 5 million was assessed as a tax liability that you're supposed to pay, is it actually the truth? Um, is it supposed to be lower or higher? So we're going into, here the investor is going into the details of the different products that you sell, what taxes apply to them, um, have we been able to clear our tax? And that's why in one of the documents that uh, most investors ask for is a tax clearance certificate that really shows that you've been able to comply and that you've paid all your tax dues. Because remember, if an investor is getting into the company and, you have, and you've not identified the tax liability on the company, the investor who is now a shareholder will then be forced to pay for this liability, which they hadn't planned for. So it's basically just understanding the state of the company's tax situation and if the company has been compliant enough. Um, the other area that is looked at here is uh, the legal side. Here on, on legal, the investor also sometimes outsources this to a, a law firm that will really dig deep into contracts, uh, will dig into um, arguments that the business has in place to make sure one, uh, these contracts and arguments are actually legally binding, but also understand that the business has taken on enough caution to safeguard itself against any lawsuits that may arise in the future. So here, this um, is looking into, so you'll be, asked, you'll be asked to submit contracts, arguments, suppliers uh, with customers. And we'll, we'll really be saying, for example, uh, assessing what can happen in any situation and is the, is the company, those arguments uh, appropriately protect uh, the company in case of any liabilities that may fall due. So this is largely the areas that will, will be uh, looked at. Some of the more technical areas like tax uh, and legal can be outsourced. And so the investor may not directly review these documents, but will rely on a third party to identify the risks in these different categories that we have talked about here. And, and I think that's, that's um, the last thing you mentioned is important because uh, depending on who the investor is, uh, different investors have different um, risk appetites for different companies. So the things that they will focus on are different. For example, if it's, if it's an investor uh, looking into a tech company, then they would do a diligence on, on, on the company's technology as opposed to maybe um, alignment or something like that. So uh, for those that may not have experience, like Alvin mentioned, they also tend to hire um, consultants to help them uh, do a thorough due diligence. And that brings me, Alvin, to the next issue of what elements are assessed, because we know different um, investors look at different elements which you, which you have more or less, um, which you have more or less looked at. Things like uh, funding, uh, things like financials, team, and uh, the whole tax, and you know, uh, legal areas. But beyond those, what are some of the other elements that um, investors would focus on? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I've, I've briefly touched on this in the previous slides. So I'm just really going to highlight uh, those that I haven't. So I'll start with uh, alignment. So just like we mentioned, uh, the DFF itself is a matchmaking um, facility. And what we, tend, want, what we tend to do 
is to match an investor with the appropriate business. So in terms of alignment, what this helps is just to make sure the vision, the mission of the investor lines up perfectly with the mission and vision, let's say, of the business. Or for example, the investor should have uh, experience in the industry that the business is, is, is currently uh, working in. Because at the end of the, of the day, investors are bringing much more than capital. On top of the money that they would bring and invest into the business, it's important for you to have an investor that will be part of the strategic decisions of the company. And so it's important that you see eye to eye and that you have common goals that you'll be pursuing throughout the life of, of, of the investment. The other one that I mentioned um, when I'm talking about the pitch deck is the team. Uh, it will be important for the investor to build comfort over the experience and skills of the team to be able to know that they'll be able to drive uh, the return on their investment and that they'll be able to really continuously grow the company. Um, the other one that really ties into their due diligence um, is really the competition, understanding um, what similar businesses are in the market, what are they doing, and how differently is this business uh, position? The other one is, I mean, on top of looking into the company and what you do, the, the investor wants to know that this is a good standing business, a, a, a business that is not involved in, uh, in lawsuits that doesn't uh, have, uh, that being perceived uh, in a negative sense by the public, by its customers. And so, on top of the due diligence or in the documents you provide, the investor will seek to look into, are there any negative stories on the company? Um, have the directors, for example, been implicated in any scandals? Just to really build a comprehensive sense of the company and what exactly they are going into. I think the rest of, of the sections, I've talked about them here and there when I was talking about the pitch deck and uh, the categories of the DD. And so I think uh, most of them will be familiar to, to you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So yeah, um, it's it's uh, most of the things, you know, um, that uh, are there, Alvin had already touched them in his previous discussions. And as we get to the end of this discussion, um, Alvin, I also know it's things that you had also uh, spoken to or, uh, you know, pointed us towards, but as entrepreneurs, uh, start or um, think of this uh, this journey towards getting funding and as they prepare for due diligence, what are some of the things that um, I know you had mentioned things like, of course, the, the pitch deck and uh, financials, but beyond those two and their, for example, product or service uh, portfolios, what are some of the other things that entrepreneurs need to have at the back of their minds as they prepare for our investor due diligence. Okay, yeah. I think the list of uh, documents here is pretty clear. I think what I can add is that when you're going into a due diligence, first of all, know that you're about 50% um, of the journey because by the time an investor decides to take the time and effort to really look into your company, it means that there is something good that you're doing and it's really a viable investment to the investor. And that all that is left for them to do is just to confirm, to do this fact finding. So I would say as much as it's a time consuming um, endeavor, it's important for the entrepreneur or the management team to just set aside time to be able to respond to the queries of the investor, but to also go over the documents um, that have been submitted. Uh, oftentimes, investors will request for, for calls 
uh, they will request for meetings with the entrepreneur. And this may seem, I mean, uh, tiresome and burdensome, because wow. as much as you have to attend to the investor, you have to spare time to still grow the business. But I would say, just be cognizant that by the time you get to the DD stage, you're 50% there, and the rest is really just uh, fact finding and really confirming that whatever you've said is actually true. So on top of these documents that you can see on the screen, I would say uh, view DD in a more positive light because not very many companies get to the DD stage. And if you have, it means there's something good about the company and that there's really interest from the investor, given that they're going to invest time and effort to really understand uh, the business. So preparation, as we said, is very important. And uh, as much as these documents actually start collecting them, for example, today you'll find that most of these are common day-to-day -day documents that you have lying around and that you only just need to organize them and uh, put them in that uh, specific folder that we have talked about. And with the rest, you can slowly build up. I would, so I would say it's more about time uh, being organized and knowing that by the time you get to DD stage, you are 50% there. Okay. And and um, what else would um, for 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 example, um, you talked about um, there's a mention here of the organogram. Um, a question coming in to me is um, here is around the team. Um, Alvin, you had emphasized the importance of uh, of, of entrepreneurs uh, paying attention to the kind of team that they have. Yeah. Uh, so as they prepare for due diligence, uh, how should they uh, prepare their team members? Because I know uh, we've gone for some due diligences and you can tell that um, the team has been coached because everyone is more or less answering or saying the same thing and using the exact same words. And this is kind of a put off for us then who come to do that due diligence because it, 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 it comes up as a red flag that the team members have been coached to say the same thing and they can't answer anything. So as entrepreneurs prepare for due diligence, how should they prepare their team for the same process? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Uh, I would say, first of all, remember due diligence is something that comes towards the end, right? What I would say is your team should be competent enough in whatever they do, that they're able to really explain um, an answer to, to the different questions investors have. I would say by the time you go to coach your team, that's sort of a vote of no confidence in your team, right? Because you, you're skewing their answers to a certain um, preferred answer that you may have. To me, if you see and you realize that you need to coach your team, it's already sort of a red flag and a risk because you should be able to comfortably walk out of the room and your team member is able to articulate the business properly, able to explain whatever part of the business they're in charge of, and they're able to really build that comfort um, over, build that comfort for the investor. But I would say, if for example, you've realized that some, that's something you need to work on, I would say it's important for you to even start having things as simple as weekly team, team meetings, where you ask every, team member to really just go over the business, to explain it to you and to explain it to other team members, just so that they are able to build confidence over the business, whatever you do, and that they're able to articulate that to, to investors. So I would say it's, it's something that you should practice for, and not practice for just for due diligence, mm -hmm. but practice for 
for the betterment of the company. Even let's say, even though there was no due diligence involved, your team members really uh, should be able to articulate about the company, explain what they do, and really uh, sell the company to the best that they can. Yeah. Uh, I, I think, yeah. I think that's very, very important because um, this brings up the issue of uh, key man risk. I know most of our businesses uh, can't run without, for example, the MD who is also the co-founder. So when he's not around, um, for example, the business cannot run and everyone else in the company cannot articulate why they are working for that company or what their strategic plan is. And without giving too much, I think it's very important for entrepreneurs to always, like Alvin said, involve the team, not just for, for um, the purpose of due diligence, but also for your uh, for the betterment of, of the running of your company. Because if if as a front desk officer, I know what the over, overall strategy is of the company, I'll do my work better. If action manager and I know where it is that the entrepreneur wants to go or what his vision is or what we are working with or what our challenges are then it's once one it's a motivation tool but also it kind of helps uh it helps me do my work better and also helps you as the entrepreneur and founder uh, as you kind of grow your business and look into raising more capital for your business so that element is very very important and thank you for asking the question around that so maybe alvin as we go to the last uh, slide on our on our presentation uh, we have a couple of questions that come in and um one of the one of the questions i had mentioned earlier in the next slide uh what how should companies prepare or manage improper disclosures because some of the companies are not entrepreneurs are not willing to reveal too much. So how much should companies reveal as they go through the due diligence process and how can these entrepreneurs protect themselves from uh, investors that may want to just come and kind of get information and use it um, for, the, for, for, other, for purposes other than why the entrepreneur is revealing that information to them. So kind of take us through why and how companies can manage their improper disclosures. And uh, Kenneth, I think this is where we will answer the question that you asked earlier in regards to if it is right and if it is important for entrepreneurs to conduct due diligence on the investors as well. Yes, yeah, that's a great question, Kenneth. And <clears throat> It's something that uh, it's as important as preparing to hand over your documents to the investor. It's also important for you to manage um, how that information you've shared uh, is managed. I mean, in this day and era, data protection and privacy is, is uh, something of utmost importance. And so we just want to encourage you, as much as you're sharing this information, um, it's important for you to just uh, put in place these measures that we're going to talk about to be able to manage how much of information in your company is shared uh, with third parties or if any. So Kenneth, straight to your question, it is as important for the entrepreneur to do a due diligence on the investor as it is for the investor to do a due diligence on the company. Now, in this era where um, there's lots of, uh, I mean, everyone can claim to be an investor. Everyone can claim to have capital to deploy. Um, everyone can really claim to, to have the best intentions of a business at heart. It's not always the case, right? So just like, uh, in your day-to-day -day life, right? If you're going around um, looking for a house, right? And there's, there's, there's a this so-called broker that you don't trust. You are not comfortable dealing with them because, I mean, as you, you all know, there's several cases where people have been defrauded and people have been conned. So in the same light, as, as you share, even before you share this information, it's important for you to understand who is the investor, 
what do you claim to be? Um, where are your offices? Where do you originate from? Um, is there anything online that I can read about your 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 invest your investments? Is there news in the past? Um, have you been involved in 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 scandals? Um, have you been involved in shady deals? So even on top of uh, searching online, in this entrepreneurial space, more so Uganda, the Uganda entrepreneurial space, you'll find that if it's really an accredited investor, it's probably, it's probably one that has interacted with a couple of, of businesses here in Uganda already. And it's one where you can ask some of your fellow entrepreneurs and they'll be able to tell you that, oh yes, this is a, a genuine uh, investor and this is one you can trust and one you can share information with. So it's always important and I can't stress this enough for you to be able to find out who is this investor? Are they who they claim to be? And uh, what have they done in the past that shows them do they have the necessary skills and experience to be able to support me in the as a business? And do they actually, um, are they an actual investor really at the end of the day? So it's important uh, to the extent that you can, please uh, search online, ask around, but also this is why um, programs like the deal flow facility are, are in place. In case you're dealing with an investor that you're not sure about, um, please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, we have um, an enormous uh, collection of investors, an enormous set of accredited genuine investors that we can always cross check for you. And we can always ask around in the industry for you. So please, um, on top of doing your own search, please feel free to always reach out to us uh, in case you need to ascertain who the investor really is. Uh, going to the, the matter on really confidentiality, uh, it's important uh, even before you share, most times investors will share an NDA or if they have not, please always have a, a draft NDA that you can always share with, with investors or whoever is interested in your company, just to safeguard whatever information that you will be sharing with them. Um, on top of that, uh, just like we mentioned, um, having these data rooms in an online space, you're able to control who has access to the information. So you're able to say this particular person with this email address is the only one able to access this folder and any additional people who request access I need to know who they are. Are they actually on the team? What's their role on the team? And do they actually need to see this information in this folder? So you should always maintain uh, control of the information you share where you can. Uh, and also always have an NDA on standby to share in case um, the investor has not shared an NDA of their own. Um, the other thing you can do to safeguard yourself is really working with uh, trusted transaction advisors, um, just like the deal flow facility, just like other well-known uh, incubators, accelerators, and business support uh, organizations in, in this country. Um, always have a second eye look over whatever is being shared by the investor or even whatever you're sharing, just to make sure it's not something that you will regret sharing later on. But also, if you're dealing with a reputable organization, you're able to ride on their professionalism, they, they are advising you in good faith and that they'll be able to safeguard your information. The last one is really, even before you share, will we'll send you sort of an information request list and also the extent to which information they want to see. So even before you share, know that the investor may not look at 
everything on the folder and know that if we are looking at, for example, commercial due diligence, I can only share, let's say, um, specifications of my product. Um, I can only share my customer list. So know what exactly is needed and where you're not comfortable, um, have discussions with the investor or give uh, reso uh, a reason of why you're not uh, comfortable sharing that information just so that you don't overshare and yet some of the information may not actually have been uh, requested. Yes. Yeah. And, and I think um, what you yeah, in regards to entrepreneurs carrying out due diligence, uh, it uh, brought me to the um, to the to what you had mentioned earlier in regards to alignment. So, as investors uh, interact with entrepreneurs and check for alignment, it's also important for entrepreneurs to kind of. Uh, check if the investor is also aligned because at the end of the day, it is your business. You know why you started it and you have a vision for it. So the investors that you're talking to should also kind of align to that, to that, uh, to, to that vision. So yes, it's important to conduct due diligence. Um, we've come to the end of our presentation. We have uh, some questions that have come through the chat. I think uh, we've answered uh, one of them in regards to alignment. The other issue was in regards to whether there are, there are courses or trainings on how to perform DD. Uh, yes, they are there. However, uh, most of the investors carry out the due diligence themselves, or like we mentioned earlier, if they, if for example, it's it's a, in a specific area that they are unable to, then we have lots of they have consultants that they use to help them carry out uh, the due diligence, like uh, for example, tech auditors or um, you know, any, other, any other area that may have a specification that the investor may not be able to handle on their own. The other question from, um, from uh, Magambo, which um, is, is, is around what, uh, what is the re realistic investment period and what is the percentage the success rate, I think, if that's what you're trying to ask, because it says, what is the realistic investment period and the percentage rate? So I think Alvin, he wants to know um, how long it takes for these investments to close and what is the success rate? Okay, yeah, thank you for that question, Magambo. So just like we mentioned, one, uh, this due diligence process really varies from investor to investor. Um, it also varies, uh, as I mentioned, from what you're trying to raise, uh, whether you're raising debt or equity. For equity, it tends to be more thorough and more comprehensive, and therefore it will take slightly longer than, than a debt uh, DD. But in terms of, 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 of timelines, we have seen DDs uh, take as short as uh, two weeks to take uh, as long as, let's say, even about six six months for more larger size uh, companies. But I would say what we have seen is that what lengthens a due diligence process is the difficulty in sharing information, more so from the entrepreneur, from the investor. Because just like I've said, by the time an investor takes on a DD, one, they're interested in whatever you're doing, and they're also interested in making an investment in the company. Because remember, as much as it's time consuming for you as the entrepreneur, the investor also has to invest time and resources. Remember I've talked about them having to hire third parties in some cases for, for certain sections of the DD. So by the time they get to this stage, they are really interested. What I would say, there is no definite timeline uh, for a DD process, but what you can do as a business looking to raise capital is have all this documentation ready. 
preparation in this case is the most important bit. Because imagine, uh, for example, the most common um, source of financing in our market here, let's say it's a bank. Even with a bank, you know that for such for financials. So that's something that should always be a part of the day-to-day -day operations of, of the business, to have your financials in order, to have them audited where possible, have those audited um, financials with you and ready to send. If an investor came and they're really, really interested in your business, they are really enthusiastic about it, and they ask for documents and, you, and they see that there is uh, a lag in receiving responses. The interest also um, probably declines on their side. So as entrepreneurs and what we encourage uh, entrepreneurs to do is do what you can on your side, which in most cases is just being prepared with the documents and being ready to share those uh, once asked. So a large part of how long it takes is, is determined by how fast you share those documents. Yeah, and you're right about that. I think the information flow, the, the quicker the investor gets information from you, then it's easier for them to you know, proceed with due diligence. Uh, Dr. Henry Kisembo will unmute you shortly. I see your hand is up. However, the other question that two questions have come through. The first one is around the difference between a money lender and a private investor. Uh, I would say they are both investors, but it depends on you as, as the entrepreneur, what, what kind of funding are you looking for? If you notice in the first slide that we presented, on the investor journey, where you identify what source of financing, uh, maybe you can pull that up. Uh, I think it's, um, Let's take it back. Here, uh, number two, determining what source of financing you are looking at. If you want to go the money lender route, then that is what you would go. Uh, private, uh, the uh, private capital or equity route, then that is the direction that you would go for. So they are both investors, but it's you as the entrepreneur to identify what kind of funding. If you want to go the banking route, it really depends on how you view your business and how you and where you think you'd be able to access that capital from in a way that aligns with your strategy. The other, the other question, and Alvin, maybe you'll take this, is around before we give Dr. Uh, Kisembo, uh, who bears the cost? Because then uh, we've mentioned um, uh, things around the investor sometimes hiring a consultant to be able to do that due diligence. Are do are due diligence, and if not, who bears the cost? Is it the entrepreneur seeking funding, or is it the investor who is willing to deploy capital? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Um, <clears throat> so. Because due diligence is really the investor building comfort on the business, most times um, it's a cost on the investor, right? So they are the ones who want um, come up with the areas that they want to look at. And if those areas are require technical expertise, they will then uh, source and, and, uh, and really hire uh, this law firms, these audit firms to do uh, their due diligence. So most times uh, it's really on the investor and it's really the cost of, 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 of them um, deploying their funds. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So um, if you have any more questions, uh, if you're shy to speak up, you can uh, send those in the chat. We are coming to the end of our presentation on Masterclass today. Uh, Dr. Henrik Sembo. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Brenda and Alvin. Uh, we I'll can't guess. hear you, Dr. Henry. You've been unmuted, but we can't hear you. Uh, can you hear me now? No. 
Yeah, I think, um, yes, we can hear you now. Hey, you can hear me now. Ella, you can hear me now, uh, Brenda? Okay, uh, thank you. And uh, I'll just hit on uh, some few very important points. Uh, and uh, the starting point, a lot has been said by, by Alvin, and I really appreciate that uh, he has represented us, our, the investors, very well. Uh, I want to caution that uh, an investee might know each and everything about their business. However, there are some little things we also look at. One is uh, the attitude, but also the mindset. 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 Sorry, the mindset and uh, the level of uh, arrogancy. Take an instance, I'm an investor, I'm picking an interest in your, in your business, no matter how much you want. And if I ask a question like, how would you justify your financials? And one says that by the time I went through series A investment or series B, then my financials are, are legit. That is a level of arrogance I can't stand. Immediately, you'll be ejected. So the mindset, attitude, and the psychology of how you present oneself to the investors is also a very pertinent matter. And it is internal, which cannot be viewed externally. But uh, Alvin spoke about uh, litigation. And uh, I wanted to just add slightly that uh, some companies are under litigation by because they were probably misguided and they went for the wrong uh, product potentially uh, investment because there are a lot of financial instruments out there. So in one case, in our case, which I can't give the names, but uh, we do buyouts. If uh, a business is struggling, it's under court or litigation because it has failed to, to pay in time, we buy out the, the, the former investor and we take on, uh, say, uh, the liability because we see something in that business. It's viable, it's feasible, it's profitable. So litigation, we can look at it in two ways. And uh, finally, is the, um, the issue of uh, what an investee should be very sure to at exactly what are they looking for in conducting a due diligence on an investor? Because one is that uh, most importantly is uh, there's the FIA of every country, Financial Intelligence Authority, which is normally under the central bank of that country. And for the case of Uganda, that's uh, the BOU. But one is uh, never go for any, any entity that is dealing in money laundering, terrorism money, money which is washed, or money which is not clear where it is uh, coming from. So that is very important to do a due diligence on that because no matter the journey you take, no matter the money they bring, the, system, the international system and protocols catch up with the investee. Uh, some of the key documents that we'll be looking at is a feasibility. What informed your business? A feasibility, a business plan, you developed it. Did you conduct some kind of feasibility study? Do you have a feasibility? But also defining your business, whether it is greenfield or brownfield. Greenfield is a business that has is not there, does not exist. But the idea is big. It's game-changing, and we are interested in it. It doesn't mean that you should have already started or there's something going for us to come in and invest. It could be Greenfield. Brownfield, 
are those that have started already and they have something to show. But even a greenfield should have uh, financial projections. I mean, you don't, don't just come and say, I have this business idea, but I'm not even sure how much I need. You must think through it. So I think patience is very key for investees, uh, no matter how much you need the investment or financing, but patience and understanding the sector and industry is very important. Thank you so Thank much. You so much. Yeah. Um, Thank, Thank you, you so, so much, much uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Um, Henry Kisembo, for those uh, words of, um, of guidance. Um, and, and I'm just, I'm just uh, wondering, uh, wondering if we, if we have, have any more questions, questions coming through. through. Uh, this, uh, this would, would be, be the opportunity, opportunity before, before we, we close, close our session. session. Any, any questions, questions coming, coming through, through, kindly raise your hand, and then we will be able to um, give you audience. Uh, Cesar Labeja. Yes, uh, how are you? Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Maurice. I'm on behalf of Cesar Labeja with the company Work for Africa with Business Services. Uh, can you hear me? Hello? Hello. We can hear you, Susan. Please go ahead. I've been doing pitch decks for about the last six years. I've been doing pitch decks for the company. I've, I've, I've pitched in a couple of places. I've pitched abroad. Now, the thing I just wanted to add is that, because uh, everybody here wants to know about pitch decks, is that your pitch deck, I like the way Alvin has presented it. The first thing I realized over time is that the pitch deck shouldn't be so flooded with words. If you can, if it can be so visual, it will win. If it's so wordy, it will not work out because people do not read words these days. I do not know because of smartphones, like maybe because of that. So if you can make your pitch deck a bit more visual, I have a couple of pitch decks I can even share with people. If you can look for the pitch deck of Uber, you can, if you look at the pitch deck of Uber, it has very, very little words. Everything is visual. That's one thing. If you're going to present to an investor, honestly, they do not have time to read. Many things they will read are the financials, but the rest, they, will, they might not read so much. That's what I wanted to add. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and thank you so much for that contribution, Caesar. Uh, like um, you mentioned, it's very important, and that is why uh, Alvin uh, mentioned that um, the pitch decks should be limited to a certain number of um, of slides, and those slides should not be so wordy. So the visual aspect of it is very very important, and thank you for highlighting that. Uh, and thanks for the contribution. Uh, we have a qu a question coming in from Magambo again. I will unmute you shortly. Hello. Hello. Hello, do you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you, but there's a lot of background noise. Please manage that because we it's, we are struggling to okay. listen to you. Okay. Okay, uh, my, my question will have been that have you looked at the Ugandan banks whereby when you deal with the investors and money has come in and one very serious question that is asked is how did you get to this investor? How do you know politically and all of that? And did you bring money for politics and all that? And then lastly, they bend down and say, how much percentage are you giving us? Have you put that into consideration? Because one of my colleagues is already affected with that. If you don't give us this percentage, we are not also releasing the money. I don't know that I'm clear on that question. Hello, am I clear on the question? 
Hello, am I clear on the question? Yes, yes, yes. yeah. Yes, yeah, well, thank you, Madam. Yes. Yeah. Um, one, I think for my oh. own sake, really, as much as um, something wouldn't advise, it's the, rea the reality on the ground. And as you've said, uh, one of your colleagues is already affected. But I would say, always involve um, a third party, a trusted uh, third party. There are people you can always um, rely on when, when you're in the midst of making an investment decision. Because once you do it alone, it's easy for you to be taken advantage. But also, you're not aware of the risks that uh, come into play. Um, so, so I would say, whatever investment decision you are making, in this day and age, there are lots of partners, uh, lots of people capable and willing to, to help you. So, it's really important that you involve a professional third party to give you advice and to enable you maneuver through those difficult situations. Because I mean, as much as uh, the money may seem readily available and it's faster, you can get it easily, they don't ask so much, you get into situations just like you've mentioned, where you have to pay off someone on the side to be able to get money. That in itself is already a red flag, but also when paying back, um, it's not uh, out of this world to imagine that this same person um, may not make it, I mean, will have unscrupulous uh, practices or make it probably hard for you to pay back. It's always never clear cut. And just know that as much as the money seems fast and free, there's always a cost that you end up paying as a business. And you may end up still like in the litigation that uh, Dr. Henry talked about. So it's always advisable, please and please uh, reach out to someone um, to have just a second eye on whatever transactions you may be entering into. Yeah, yeah. And, and also that's where the due diligence um, we spoke about earlier comes in. And as you as you decide to go uh, to look to go through this investment journey, it's important and it's something that I'd mentioned earlier for you to think about where your source of financing or where your source of funds is going to come from. Are you going to go the money lender route like someone asked earlier? Then do your research and due diligence around it. Are you going to go the bank route? Uh, look at the pros and cons of, um, of, of, of getting funding from the bank. Are you looking for a private equity investor? And then do your research ar ar around that. Are you going to go to family and friends? What are the payment terms around that? So those are some of the things as an entrepreneur that you need to think about. And, and this should actually form part of your strategy at the start of every year. And that's why we thought we would have this this masterclass as we end the year and go into the new year. So that as you're planning and looking forward to starting this journey, or if you are already in the process, there are things that, that you may not have thought about. And this is that opportunity for you to, you know, think about them and see how, um, how you can weigh what works and what does not work for you as an entrepreneur. Because at the end of the day, as an entrepreneur, your business is key and the success of your business is very important. Uh, I don't know if, um, okay, yeah. So um, um, I think Amos Odong, you had sent a, a question to me. I've responded to you uh, privately because I don't think it's a question for everyone. Uh, I don't know if there are any other questions that are coming through before we close our session. Okay, uh, there is nothing uh, going coming through. We have some contributions from Dr. Henry Kisembo in the chat room. Please feel free to read through. Uh, he's giving us some some tips on how you can uh, customize your pitch decks. Thank you for that, Doctor. And I think the rest of the participants will will be able to read through it. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to thank you all for making time and at and attending this session. 
We normally have these master classes on a quarterly basis. It's something that we intend to focus on more even next year to take you through the different phases to enable you be able to, you know, to kind of ease the journey and 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 see how we can contribute to, you know, just making all the entrepreneurs that we work with and those in the ecosystem investor ready and to kind of point you in the right direction as you as you start that journey. Jenny, we thank our partners that have um, that have joined in on this uh, on this masterclass, and to all the entrepreneurs, thank you. We will be sharing this presentation. We will uh, link. We will share the link on our different social media pages. If you're not following us on LinkedIn, we request that you um, follow us on uh, LinkedIn, on Twitter, and also you can visit our website for more information. Uh, Alvin has linked that in the chat. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we wish you a lovely, lovely holiday. We wish you a Merry Christmas, and we hope that you start the new year on a high and better note. And we look forward to more such interactions um, next year. Thank you so much, Alvin, for the lovely presentation and for the insights that you've shared today. Uh, thank you all. Have a good day and enjoy the holidays.